certainly good that we can assemble once again to worship the great God of this universe and to have the, the opportunity and the privilege to look into his word once again. And we are examining this portion of Paul's epistle to the Corinthians where he is addressing the congregation and how that they should react to the false teachers as well as addressing the false teachers, the false apostles, as the one who will name in the, in the next chapter, and how that he encourages them to take care of this situation before he comes so that he does not have to uh, use his power to inflict punishment <coughs> on them when he comes. He wants to come in the spirit of meekness and love and so forth. And so as he says here, uh, he says, I beseech you that you may not be bold when I am present with, uh, present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some. So there's the one he is admonishing the congregation to be aware of as well as admonishing them that they need to uh, change their ways. And he says, uh, these some which think of us as if we walk according to the flesh. And he says, we walk, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And then he says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we pick up our study then in, in verse 5 where he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <clears throat> and so he says here that, and as he said in verse 4, that uh, the weapons, so he, he adopts this metaphor of military terminology, just like we looked at in the last study, uh, the, the, uh, how he uses the analogy of the armor of a soldier. But he uses this analogy here, this metaphor of military uh, language and terminology. And he says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, the word there that is rendered pulling down is a noun, for which, in verse 5, casting down is the verb of that. So it's essentially the same word, just noun-verb relationship there. And in the Greek, uh, most of the time the nouns were built from the verb. And so when you look this up, for instance, in Strong's, and you look at a word and it says this comes from, and that's, that's why. So he's essentially saying the same thing. Our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. And so we will look at that verse in the New King James, which says, casting down arguments. Now the reason I show you that is the word, the term rendered imaginations here is not the typical term throughout the rest of the New Testament that is uh, rendered imaginations. And in fact, this word, imagination, is only found here and in Romans 2 and verse 15, where Paul said, which show the work of the law in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness, and their thoughts, and that's the word that's rendered imaginations here, their, their thoughts, thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or excusing one another. And so I want to look at what he says here because I believe this is very important for us to look at what he's saying, but why he's saying this, and to look at it, we'll look at one example at least of how this is employed by Paul in another text. This casting down arguments. Now, the, again, the word casting down, it has a literal application. For instance, we read in Mark 15, verse 36, 
that one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, uh, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down, take down, okay? So that would be a literal application of that particular word. All right, then again, in verse 46 of that chapter of Mark 15, it says, and he bought, and this is referring to Joseph of Arimathea, of course, and he bought fine linen and took him down, took down, so he took down the body of Christ, okay? So again, there is the, the literal use of that term. All right, we'll see that again in Luke 12, 18, for instance, where the rich farmer said, this will I do, I will pull down my barns, build greater. But there's also the figurative application of this term. And we'll find, we'll, we'll look at a few examples of that. For instance, in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46, and this is where uh, uh, Mary came to Elizabeth, and when Mary entered the room, the infant in Elizabeth's womb, John the Baptist, leapt for joy, and the text tells us that she was filled with the Holy Ghost. But it says here, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low, now notice this, he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength from his arm, he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. And this is why that I pointed out that the word imagination in our text is different. It's different than the word that is rendered here, imagination. Okay, But notice in verse 52, He hath put down, that's the word casting down in our text, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. So you see, though, this is not uh, a literal application like taking the body of Jesus down from the cross, taking down. This is more of a figurative application here in the putting down of the mighty and exalting them of low degree. All right, in Acts chapter 19, we see here when Paul was at Ephesus preaching Christ and the resurrection, uh, the people there, and, and specifically the, uh, the silversmiths, they come together and said, Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence destroyed, should be destroyed. So there's the casting down. So notice that, it, well, maybe even in time, the, the physical, literal statue would be destroyed, maybe. But notice what, is, what they're saying would be destroyed, her magnificence. That's a perception. That's something that is in the hearts and the minds of the people because there are no gods other than the true and living God, and that's what Paul was teaching. There, and in one place he does say there are gods, okay? Those things do exist, but they're not real. And that's, it, it's all in the mind of the person. The behold, <laughs> beauty is in the mind of the beholder. I think of that statement. Um, but this perception of magnificence and the allegiance and the obeisance, the worship that people would pay, for lack of a better word, to this false god, that's what would be cast down. That's what would be destroyed. And that's what the, the silversmiths are saying here. So it's, again, casting down arguments or imaginations and see Paul would write in the first epistle here to the Corinthians 
he said, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. He would write again in chapter 3 of 1 Corinthians, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And then, one of the, what I want to look at when we consider what Paul is saying here in our text, that the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God, of course, to the pulling down of strongholds, to the casting down imaginations, the casting down of arguments. And see, um, I really need to, to look that up because there's a lot of Jewish, Jewish sophistry uh, that was in existence. And this is how Jesus would use sound logic to refute their arguments and as I said in the last study, they were intelligent enough to realize when their arguments were confuted and they wouldn't, they would, they'd hush then and wouldn't ask any more questions. But I want to look at, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, of course, this is Paul's discourse on the resurrection. And I want us to notice one of Paul's styles of argument, of argumentation, because that's what he's saying here in our text that the weapons of our warfare, they're mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, to casting down arguments, argumentation. Okay, now, in 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll go there. In 1 Corinthians 15, and we'll begin in verse 12 and read just a few verses here. Now, Paul says here, Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead... How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So now again, we have another one of these instances where there is this group of some. And they are making an argument. They are saying that there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, the dead here in the original is in the plural. Okay, so it is there is no resurrection of the dead ones, of the dead and Christ, he arose from the dead. It from is E-K, which is out of or out from. And that's why we say that this is talking about the resurrection out from among the dead ones. Okay, now, be that as it may, what I want us to notice, this is kind of a side note as we're going to look at Paul's style of argumentation here. As a side note, I want us to notice the present tense language that Paul uses here, and he uses this throughout the chapter. But we're just going to look at a little bit of it here because we're not going to take time to read the whole chapter. All right, now, he says, if Christ be preached, all right, so that is present tense because the apostles were right then, at that time, presently preaching Christ. Okay, so we can see the present tense there. If Christ be preached, that he rose from the dead, how say, say is present tense. This is something they were right then in, in real time saying, okay? So we should be able to see that that is present tense. We can understand that. How say some among you that there is? There is is present tense just like be preached is present tense. And just like these some were saying, present tense, you see that? How say some among you that there is? Notice Paul did not say, how say some among you that there shall be, future tense, no resurrection of the dead. He says, how say some among you that there is, present tense, no resurrection of the dead. And the point I'm getting at there as our sideline thought is that Paul's language, when we look at the original language, indicates that the resurrection was in process right then. 
It was in progress. Right then, present tense. All right, so he says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be, again, that's present tense. He didn't say, but if there shall be. No, he didn't say that. He said, but if there be, present tense, no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. Now, Paul is using a style of argumentation here that there's a Latin term for it, and it's it's called modus tollens, and which is, as I said, a Latin term. Mode it simply means that by denying, denies. Okay, now what that simply means is, okay, an argument is made, so if argument A is true, then the conclusion B must follow. Since conclusion B is false, then argument A is false. See, by denying, it denies. That's the argumentation that Paul is using here. If it's true that there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. You see, the Corinthians would say, <clears throat> even these some would have to say, well, sure, we're not saying that. We're not saying Christ is not risen because Paul has just told them that they are, present tense, being saved by the resurrection of Christ. That's what their salvation lie, was lying in. So it's obvious they were not denying that Christ was risen. So Paul makes this argument, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. So since the conclusion that Christ is not risen is false, then the argument, there be no resurrection, is false. All right, he goes on and says, And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, <clears throat> and your faith is also vain. So Paul is taking this to the next level. If your argument is right, then this conclusion must follow. And if that conclusion must follow, then this next conclusion must follow. But since that's false, then the first one's false, then your argument is false. And then he says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified that God, that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. So again, if your argument is right, that there is no resurrection of the dead, that the dead rise not, then all these other conclusions must follow. And since those are false, then your argument is false. So we see his, the power and the logic of Paul's argumentation here. Now, again, in verse 15, where he says, Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Rise is in the present tense. Again, present, not future tense. That's present tense. And then Paul says, for if the dead rise not, present tense, then is not Christ raised. Is raised is present tense. Again, we've got to pay attention to the language. That's present tense. For if the dead rise not, if they are not rising, okay, then Christ has not risen. He is not raised, present tense. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, and you are yet in your sins. And he takes it a step further, and he says, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And he says, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And now here's Paul's argument. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? And so looking at Paul's argument here in using this weapon, the weapon of the Christian's warfare, Paul uses logic, and he uses this argument to show them that now if what you're saying is, and that's, again, that's another way of stating this type of argument, it's the if-then, if this is true, then this conclusion must follow. Since the conclusion is false, then your argument's false. So because these some were saying 
that there is, present tense, no resurrection of the dead, then because these other conclusions must logically follow, and since they are false, then their argument of there is no resurrection of the dead ones, that's false. So there is the resurrection of the dead one, that's what Paul is saying. And, and the fact proves that because Christ is risen, which they admit, and in which their salvation was lying. And that's what he says in the first four verses of this chapter. Um, and, and even following there. But he says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and, befer and become the first fruits of them that slept. All right, so we'll go back to our text where he says then, casting down, imagine, uh, the weapons of our warfare, they are mighty through God. And he says, casting down arguments. And so Paul uses that particular weapon of logic, of argumentation, logical argumentation, to refute the false statement of those some who were saying there is no resurrection of the dead. And so we can see then how that using uh, logical argumentation based on God's word, how this will refute false doctrine and false arguments. Okay, and he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now, Looking at this and every high thing, again, this is a, a figurative application here. And even though there is a, a literal aspect, and we'll, we'll look at that, there is a literal aspect to these things, just like the great goddess Diana, you have a literal physical idol, a material idol, but the preeminence of that is in people's minds. So you have, you have a literal aspect. Well, the same way with this, every high thing. And so you would have uh, authorities, kings, uh, great spiritual leaders who would be uh, a high thing. They are exalted simply because of man's perception of them and man's worship of those things. And so the weapons of the Christian's warfare, those are mighty to the casting down of these high things and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Remember, Paul said, God takes the wise in their own craftiness. But I want to look at Isaiah chapter 2, just a few verses here, where the writer, and now he, you, you need to get the context, and we don't have time to develop this, but chapter 2, 3, and 4 of Isaiah applies to the judgment, the day of the Lord judgment, that was predicted in Israel's last days concerning Judah and Jerusalem. That's verse 1 of the text. All right, now, Isaiah says, and he predicts that at this day of the Lord, verse 12, that it, people would say, enter into the rock, hide thee in the dust, for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. Now, hang on to that phrase, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. All right, he says in the next verse, the lofty, notice the elevated, the exalted things, the lofty looks of man shall be humbled. And the haughtiness, there's the exalted, the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So see right there is the prediction, a prediction, of the very thing Paul is talking about here. The high thing it will be cast down. And those, that, those things that exalt it themselves against the knowledge of God would be cast down. The things of low degree would be exalted. All right, verse 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he says, he shall be brought low. So he'll be cast down, as Paul says in our text here. All right, then in verse 17 of Isaiah 2, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, 
and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. So again, he repeats what he just said in verse 11. And then he repeats again in verse 19. They shall go into the holes and the rocks and into the caves of the earth. Here's that phrase again. For fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. When he arises to shake terribly the earth. He repeats the same thing again in verse 21. They'll go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. There's that phrase again for the third time in that text. When he arises to shake terribly the earth. Now the reason I selected this to demonstrate what Paul is saying in our context here is because, is because Paul would write in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, in verse 4 begin, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that you be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, now notice, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Right here, Paul quotes verbatim from the Septuagint, but Paul quotes verbatim that phrase we just read three times from Isaiah chapter 2, that the people would flee, they'd go into the rocks and the caves and so forth to hide from the glory of his, how was it he said it? For the glory of his majesty, for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. From the Septuagint, Paul is quoting that text verbatim right here. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Now, the re again, the reason I tie this all together is because Paul goes right on. There, there were no chapter breaks in the original letters. So Paul goes right on and says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, and that word is parousia there, the parousia, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now, there's, there's a whole other subject right there, a whole other lesson. Our gathering together. But now notice, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as, as. Notice that, as, from us. As that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, the King James translators blundered right here because if this is correct, a correct translation, then it is a direct contradiction of what we read in James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8, where James wrote and told the brethren to be patient unto the parousia of the Lord. And he said, the parousia of the Lord is at hand. And that's what James wrote. And the word, the terminology that Paul uses here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is not the same term rendered at hand, is not the same term that is used in James chapter 5. And I don't have time to get into that study. Uh, but this, this word that, that is rendered at hand here is an exclusive word used by Paul, I think, seven times in his epistles. But it, and we'll, let's just look at that in the New King James, and notice, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Now that is a more correct translation of the word and uh, what, they, what these false apostles, again, notice that, that that's why I emphasized what he said there that as a letter as from us, 
You see, there were false apostles. And by what he says here, this would indicate that they were writing letters. They were imposters. They were forging letters. And they were saying that the day of Christ had already come, that it had already arrived. So that's what they were saying. Okay, now, but notice what Paul says here. Let no man deceive you. Now again, notice the context. Now we beseech you, brethren, who's Paul talking to? You, brethren. All right, he says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day, what day? The day of Christ, the day of the Lord, the parousia, the day of the Lord. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. So again, here Paul is using logical argumentation and he's showing them that this claim that the day of Christ had already come was false. He says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day will not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. Now notice, here's what ties in with our text. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Now notice that. Now I'm going to back up to our text. In verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Look at what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 who opposeth and exalteth the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not, now notice this, who's Paul talking to? Remember you not that when I was yet with you, now you see, Paul was not with me. He was with the, the Thessalonians. And that's who he's talking to. Remember you not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now, notice that, now you know what withholdeth, and that's the King James, the word means restrained, you know what restrains that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, that's again King James, letteth and withholdeth is the same word. It means restrained. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his parousia, his coming. So again, as Paul says in our text, that the weapons of our warfare, they are mighty through God to the casting down of arguments, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And here we have a direct example of what Paul is predicting, this man of sin who was in existence right then. And the Thessalonians right then knew what this and who this was. They knew what was restraining the man of sin. You see that they could not know what was restraining the man of sin if both the man of sin and what was be, and what was restraining the man of sin was not in existence. So when we look at the context, that proves that this is not something in our future. This is not something to cast fear in our minds of some uh, alleged event in our future. So I wanted us to see that, that uh, the way that Paul uses doctrine, and it destroys, it casts down every high thing 
that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so even though, again, there would be this literal aspect, there would be a literal person that would sit in the literal temple, the Jewish temple, and exalt himself above all that is called God. And that would be cast down. And, and the perception of that exaltation would be made low. It would be brought down. It would be destroyed. It would be cast down. And so we can see the both the figurative and the literal use of these terms. And uh, we're out of time, so I'll have to end the study here. But I want us to, to look at this idea and what Paul is, is teaching here about the Christian's warfare and the weapons that are used to refute Christ, but also to refute false doctrine and how that these weapons are mighty through God. You see, this is nothing of me. This is nothing of my intelligence or whatever little that may be. This is all through the power of God and his word. His word is inspired. And when we will apply ourselves to studying his word and handle it aright, as Paul told Timothy to study, then we can use sound logic and reasoning from the word of God and we can refute false doctrine. And so anyway, that's uh, we'll close our study here and, and continue on uh, with this uh, vein of thought here uh, in the Christian's warfare and the weapons uh, in the Christian's arsenal.